let's start by thinking about the urban spaces around us. Think of our homes, offices, hotels, uh, restaurants, classrooms, dorms, auditoriums like this one. Now, think about how we design them, how we lay them out. We think about a space where we sleep, that's a bedroom. A space where I meet with others, meeting room. A space where I teach, classroom. We assign specific functionalities to discrete spaces, resulting in all kinds of rooms. And obviously, as all activities cannot happen at the same time, most of the rooms are unused most of the time. Don't be surprised. This is nothing new. If we were to play, spot the difference between these two architectural plans, I'm sure you wouldn't have problems finding slight differences between them. But what if I told you that the biggest difference by far between these two plans is that they are 2,000 years apart. The one on the left is my parents' apartment back home. The one on the right, who knows? Maybe it belonged to a Roman Empire captain. Wow. Architects, designers, it looks that like we've been doing the same for quite a long time. But some of you may be thinking now, why is that a problem? And I'm going to tell you something I hope you will agree with me. Romans did not have the challenges we have today. The world is urbanizing. Population is growing and growing. And actually, nine out of 10 of these new people are going to be living in cities. If that is not enough, rural people are moving to cities too. In China and India alone, 600 million people are going to be moving from towns to cities in the next 15 years. That is twice the population of the United States in 15 years. So summary of these numbers, new people plus rural people, what this means is that for every building you see out there, we are going to have to build another one in 10 years. So the question is, how do we do this? We can keep ignoring the context and building things with the same space paradigm as Romans had 2,000 years ago with a very basic difference, of course, that we can build a little bit taller. But you don't need to imagine anything to see where this takes us. Go to China. They took the suburban sprawl that the United States invented with the automobile and put it on steroids, the tower sprawl. Single functionality ghettos. Same problems as the suburban sprawl, but with another order of magnitude. It looks like we are having some trouble to understand that if it, if it takes you 45 minute one hour car drive to grab a bite with friends, uh, buy some groceries, or go to work, the world eventually starts collapsing. And as MIT City Science Director Kent Larson would say, cities are for people, not for machines. But okay, I know we tend to be pretty short-sighted. So if you don't care about how the world is gonna look like in 10 to 15 years, let me tell you how this affects you and your city today. Of course, no one wants to live in, in ghettos, you know? More and more people want to live in vibrant, walkable, central locations where the action happens. But if you're in one of these groups, young professional, elderly, working class, uh, single, forget about it. Seriously, forget about it. You're being priced out, kicked out of the cities where you want to live in. Places like Boston, S San Francisco, New York, London, Shanghai, Sydney, Hong Kong. And this is terrible, by the way, especially in the case of the creative class, because we are kicking out of our cities the very people these cities need to remain globally competitive in an interconnected world. Of course, mayors all over the world have realized about that. And it is obvious that when you are lacking resources, you have to start being more efficient about them. But what does that mean for space? Right now, this is what it means. As a square footage is by far the biggest cost, we are making spaces smaller and smaller. And I'm sure you've heard about this macro trend towards micro units, and also about the negative reactions that that is triggering. <laughs> the problem is not that spaces are becoming smaller. The problem is that old solutions don't solve new problems. Because no one, wants, no one wants to live in a 
tiny, cramped, conventional shoebox prison cell. So what is the alternative then? What is the alternative? So basically, we need to rethink the way we design, we create, we relate to our spaces. Based on two very basic principles we learned throughout our research at the MIT Media Lab. Number one, we don't need as much space as we think we need. The truth is that we are surrounded by space killers. Yes, space killers. Actually, you are surrounded by some of them right now. Think about them. I don't want a bed to consume my room in a hotel or in my house when I'm not sleeping. I don't want uh, my awesome office space to be blocked my, by a meeting table when I'm not having a meeting. Or I don't want this auditorium, for example, to be useless right after this event. Think about them. Space killers are those elements that are great when we use them, but they just kill the space right after that. And worst of all, they make us think that we need much more space than what we actually need. Now, some of you may be thinking, this MIT geek has not realized that architects and designers have been playing with reconfigurable spaces for years, decades. Like foldable tables, uh, foldable beds, manually operated moving walls. I know. Hundreds of examples of prototypes have been built in the last years. The problem is that they are all one-off expensive prototypes, art installations, that do not really scale to commercial real estate development. And what is really the point? If the only people that can afford these technologies or solutions are the people that don't need to downsize. <laughs> so, of course, trying to answer that, um, trying to find more scalable solutions that could be implemented in some of those micro unit developments. Believe it or not, developers are using a piece of furniture that is the same piece of furniture that my grandparents had in their house 30 years ago. And that is the Murphy bed. <laughs> the Murphy bed is a vivid example that making transformation easy is not enough. Think about it. Making your bed is easy. Taking out the pillows uh, so they don't crash when the bed uh, is folded is easy. Putting some straps on the bed sheets so they don't fall is easy. But the whole process is a pain. <laughs> so thinking, uh, when thinking about reconfigurable spaces, transformable spaces, making transformation easy is not enough. Transformation needs to be effortless, and if possible, magical. So how do we bring magic into mundane things? We call it furniture with superpowers. <laughs> what if a gentle gesture or a gentle touch could move heavy objects, like beds, closets, walls, as if they were weightless? What if those architectural elements could have different shapes, form factors, materials, so that they could adapt to different users and different spaces. Think about it, young, uh, elderly, families, but also hotels, homes, offices. What if your furniture was an intelligent hub so that the Internet of Things was not anymore about just peripherals, such as lighting or thermostats, but also about the things that really give personality to your space, that could understand your emotions, could understand how you are sitting when you fall and react to that? And what if all of this was programmable, the same way we program our mobile phones? Think about your home app store. <laughs> your home app store, your office app store. So you download the functionalities you want and the applications you want. This 200 square feet apartment is just an example of what could happen if we could bring superpowers to the architectural elements around us. We call it architectural robotics. So if principle number one was that we don't need as much space as we think we need, you just saw principle number two in action. The only way of making a space truly act like if it was twice or three times bigger is through robotics. And robotics doesn't boil down to these humanoid robots trying to conquer the world in the movies. Robo robotics is much more than that. Think about all those robots that are already making your lives much easier and much more efficient. Think about the coffee maker, the dishwasher, the vacuum cleaner, the elevator. Those are all robots, too. So in a nutshell, 
Urban spaces are too valuable to be static and unresponsive. We need robotics to turn those spaces, those static and dummy spaces, into dynamic and intelligent architecture. But hold on. We know that presenting a grandiose vision is not enough. We need to create the tools that allow to deploy these ideas at a scale and boost that way a revolution on how spaces are created. So my team and I went one step farther. We understand that architects and designers don't necessarily have the know-how on how to implement some of these complex robotic ideas. What they are missing, though, is just having access to the right tools. So we got inspired by what LEGO and the Media Lab created 20 years ago. They created a kit of parts that compartmentalizes the complexities of mechanics, electronics, and software, and that allows kids to explore their craziest, wildest ideas of what could happen if LEGOs were not static and dummy anymore. Fast forward 20 years, we are creating a kit of parts for grown-ups, for architects, for designers, because we really think they need the tools to face, to tackle the challenges we have. Think about those mechanical standardized blocks that could translate heavy things or could move things around. Or why not deploy from the ceilings? Think about those electronic blocks that allow things to be smart to think, but also to be connected to other smart devices. And think about a software API that allows to program new functionalities and behaviors. <laughs> we profoundly believe that the moment you let creative people work on applications without having to worry on low-level complexities of engineering, for example, the moment you create a revolution. But for those still skeptical, let me tell you this is not science fiction anymore. This is now. If you don't believe that robotics could be so mainstream so soon, think about arguably the only transformable element most of us have in our homes. And do you know what that is? The garage door opener. <laughs> no, think about it. A huge door moving up and down, up and down, every morning, every afternoon, reliable, safe, even with internet connectivity, some of them. $200. You don't even think about the robotic aspect of it. And definitely, you cannot go back in time to move those heavy doors manually. So why garage doors had such a privilege over walls, beds, closets for so many years? <laughs> so back to the beginning. As I said before, all solutions don't solve new problems. Strategies decided now will dramatically affect the livability of the places where we will live and work in the future. And don't get me wrong. Architectural robotics is not here to force you to live in a smaller and a smaller spaces. Architectural robotics is here to augment the capabilities of your spaces, whatever size they are. It is about efficiency, but it is also about responsiveness and the way we relate to our spaces. <laughs> the story does not boil down to big spaces anymore. It is about big experiences. So if you're excited about this new world of possibilities, let me tell you one more thing. My team and I are on a mission to take all of these ideas outside of the laboratory and into the world starting today. So look around you. Look at those mundane objects. Look at those space killers. And think about what they could do if they had superpowers. Thank you.